that's one of the reasons why I know that there's lots of things that translate from college to NFL. I just don't think it's going to be one of them. Yeah. Like, wins being a quarterback stat. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's right. Darn straight, you know. <laughs> This week is a little challenging because the league year is right around the corner, right? And we only record one day a week, and then we release the episodes throughout the entire week. So this one's a little close to the best for us because this is going to come out Monday, so it's going to be right when that legal tampering period starts. I know you've had a lot of stuff that you... I know you've had a busy week, so is there anything that you wanted to get to before that the all hell breaks loose on Monday, right? Because it's all hell is going to break loose on Monday with this legal tampering period. Yeah. And I know you've had the tour recently. So was there any topic that got brought up that you wanted to get at before you can get at it yourself through another avenue? I mean, not really. There's nothing really that, that, that I thought of that was like, oh, I really want to talk about this. I think that is interesting is that I think we could pretty much do an entire show on this year being the year of surprises. Yeah. Surprising that Josh Allen broke out the way he did. Surprising that Brian Dable stayed. Surprising the front office stayed. Surprising the Bills re-signed Milano and Williams. Surprising. Yeah. So I think there's there's a connection there. There's an overarching connection. You could probably do an entire pod just based on that. Yeah, I think it's just just to pivot off that, right? So I'm thinking that this is the year of continuity, right? So we look at the free agents that Brandon Bean has been able to retain, not free agents, but the pending free agents Bean has been able to retain, right? You All of a sudden, you get Matt Milano, he's back. You get Daryl Williams, he's back. You get three guys to restructure. I really have to wonder how possible would that have been if you had a new offensive coordinator coming in in 2021, a new defensive coordinator coming in in 2021, new defensive line or offensive line coaches, right? Uh, a new linebackers coach, a new secondary coach. Uh, since you have a completely returning staff, how possible would those have been, those resignings have been, had there been changes, right? Or you look at this Bill's staff, no staff stays together this long. No. No staff stays together this long and wins. Well, I mean, you're not wrong. The fact of the matter is that there are certain things that we just kind of take for granted about human beings. And one of them is human beings are resistant to change. And that's not really true. Human beings are resistant to change if they like what they're doing. <laughs> if they, <laughs> yeah. they like what they're doing, then, then they're resistant to change. Um, otherwise, they're very, very poor change, especially professional football players. So when you have familiarity, familiarity breeds trust. And when you have familiarity that exists in a positive environment, that exacerbates that trust. Well, I think, and that's when you're able to get those things done. You're able to get the pickups done. You're able to get the re-signings done that are reasonable market contracts and not have to pay out the wazoo to make it happen. You get those things because the people are happy with the situation that they're in. Well, there's also millions of reasons as to why they might <laughs> prefer something over another. You know, like, right. I, I, I'm I, with you there. Um, I, I do want to mention, though, Something I think it, I don't want to misquote, but I think it was I saw it. On, I saw Perino report it, but I don't know where it was said. Where Daryl Williams talked about when he got into Buffalo, he felt comfortable in his own skin. That I think that's a direct. Yeah. That's that's. I'm summarizing yeah. that quote a little bit, but I don't think I'm taking it out of context. And I think that's a huge. That's a huge piece to not only retaining players but getting players that the Bills might not have had an opportunity to get otherwise. Yeah, the Bills are winning right now, but you look at Cleveland, right? You think Cleveland players are like, oh, yeah, this is the place to be. I think players are still going to be sketchy of that. Yeah. But when all you hear out of Buffalo and all you hear out of the 716 is, you know, Jordan Poyer's down there trying to, trying to you know, recruit Carlos Dunlap. He's out there trying to recruit Carlos or Xavier Rhodes because he's working out with him. 
These are the things that the players are trying to do because the team can't. Yeah. Is that unique to Buffalo right now in this environment? And, and are, are teams that thrive in that going to do better than other teams with since you know we're running into sort of an unprecedented time with contracts and salary line or salary numbers and, and contract lengths in the next two years, it's kind of unprecedented. Yeah, yeah, everyone thinks that players only care about money, and they do care about money. They care about money a lot, but it's bigger than that. They want quality of life, and money money is a big part of quality of life for sure. And they but they want quality of life. They want a good quality of life, and some people are just happy in certain organizations and as long as the money is not bad enough to take it away from their quality of life and they're going to care about that so it's one of those scenarios where listen you know i i like it here but i don't two million dollars like it here so if it's a two million dollar <laughs> difference per year then i'm going to go somewhere else because the money is a big part of quality of life but it's not the only thing it is a big part of quality of life it's that way with all of us you know, you say, listen, I really like my job. I don't want a $10,000 raise. You might say that. I really like my job. I won't go somewhere else for $10,000. I might go somewhere else for $50,000. <laughs> but everyone, everyone has that line. Everyone has that specific line. And players are no different, right? And if the quality of life is good because of you like your workplace and you like your boss and you like your coworkers, then you might be willing to just say, listen, just make sure I'm paid fairly. I want to be paid fairly. You know, don't disrespect me with the money because money is a symbol of respect for a lot of these players and if you you know come in and say you know daryl williams you paid we paid you 2.25 million dollars last year you played really well here's four million dollars what do you think and he goes i'm sorry what now <laughs> you, you 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 want me to you want me to do what now then he says okay you know i, I think i'm gonna pass you know because there's a line so it's really a quality of life thing and money is a huge part of quality of life but so is respect which is generated by money, and so are your coworkers, and so is everything else. So, I think having players who view Buffalo as being a place they can achieve their highest quality of life, like Sean McDermott says, they say, "Hey, I want to bring in somebody who can be their best version of themselves." Right? If your version of quality of life is sunshine and prostitutes, then Buffalo might not be the place for you. Nope. Right. <laughs> it, it depends on what you view your maximum quality of life to be. Well, right. What is it that you want ideally? And if they continue to bring in the players who don't look at that as being their maximum quality of life, then they're going to have a shot to retain them. Yeah, it's interesting that you bring that up, right? Because the trade, Which trade. Part? Well, there's a yeah, there's, <laughs> there's a lot there. There's a lot that was interesting about it. So Trey White talked about how he was getting pressure from other players when he was looking at signing an extension because Trey was going to set market value, right? You yes. look at Lattimore, Lattimore hadn't signed yet, mm -hmm. right? So you looked at the dynamic of who was out there and players were pressuring on Trey because you're right. It, money is a measuring stick in a locker room. And I think sometimes we forget that there's grown men in a locker room and sometimes insecurity is a big problem, right? In contract fixes insecurity, right? Money fixes insecurity mm -hmm. in some instances. Uh, and Sean McDermott talking about being the best version of yourself is a little Tony Robbins. And we talk about Captain Banana Hands an awful lot. <laughs> uh, but um, I, I just want to, real quick, I'm curious, uh, I don't want to I don't want to grab a shovel, but do you think that part of it, when J.J. Watt was a free agent, right? Just to go back real quick, you're looking at the top suitors and you're looking at Cleveland, Green Bay, Buffalo, Right. And what are you seeing? Cold, no dome, cold, no dome, yep. cold, no dome. And you've got a JJ Watt who's like, well, I don't mind the sunshine every now and again. Like, I'm, I, you know, I, I wouldn't mind being warm. You're in Houston the whole time. Like, I wouldn't mind being warm. Do you really think amenities in a situation like JJ Watt made a difference? Right. Because just, just from a, just from a, just from a geographic location, Buffalo and Arizona couldn't be any different. And we have a, our partner, our sponsor sells homes in Arizona, and even we can't deny the fact that Arizona is probably a much more um, a, a, is a much generally nicer climate than us. Yes. You know, like for an older player, 
maybe Arizona does offer you more from a quality of life standpoint. Well, I, I get that. And it, dep- it depends on how you define quality of life. I'll give you a great example. So my perfect weather, my perfect weather is 62 degrees and overcast. That is my favorite weather. I consider that to be God's weather. That's what it's going to be like. You know, if I, if there's, if I feel like and I go there, it's going to be 62 degrees and overcast for me. But that's subjective. What you view as being your particular best available quality of life is subjective. And that's where the uniqueness and individuality of players comes into play so much, is that for J.J. Watt, the quality of life might be sunshine and desert. And that's his quality of life. And that means more to him. And there'll be other people who say, yeah, I like that stuff, but it's not as important to me as liking my boss. And then other people might be like, listen, I don't even care if I like my boss. If I get to go home every night and it's eight degrees and dry, I'm good. Everyone has different things that matter to them. And the locker room is big, for sure. And the NFL locker room is bigger than professional sports in general. However, it's still made up of individual players with competing priorities and people who value things differently. And so one of the things that Sean McDermott and Brandon Dean are trying to do when they talk about process is not bring in choir boys who are going to help old dudes across the street. That's not the way that they've historically done things. It's people who love football and they're so football focused that if they're in a good football environment, then that's quality of life for them. If coming to their job, that's good quality of life. The quality of life for you is, yeah, I listen, I, I do this. That's what I do. I, I punch in, I punch out, I care about it. But really, I want to be in a nice place, right? I want to make sure that I get uh, low taxes. I want, like All these things that are important to lots of people, that may impact whether or not Brandon Dean and Sean McDermott value you the same way, because if you really love football, then you're going to love a football-centric environment where the football-related stuff, right, your coaches care about you, they work hard, we care about football, we like football, we enjoy to do these things, we're all in here to get better at football and to learn, then if that's what you love, if you love football, then you're going to love Buffalo. And that's what they're trying to build. They're trying to build a scenario where in Buffalo, if you love football, you'll love Buffalo. And if you love other stuff, then you might still love Buffalo, but you might not love it as much. And if you don't love it as much, we might love you as much. I'm just curious, though, because Paul was talking about continuity earlier. You're talking about quality of life with the seller. How much do you think that the signings of Milano and Williams were, if you had to get like a percentage, like 60, 40, 70, 30, how much was it the salary cap being reduced versus the continuity with the team? Because Paul and I are in agreement in, in the effect of if the salary cap went up like it has in recent years, I don't think Williams or Milano signed in Buffalo. I'm of that mindset. I don't think they do. Um, I could be wrong, obviously. They did sign. But I I think a large part of that was the cap going down and looking at other teams that could pay them the money they wanted, being like, oh, do I really want to go to Jacksonville and play linebacker down there? Like, okay, there's no state tax. However, they're 1-15. So what do I do? The hypotheticals are hard for me because I – I've been so programming myself that we are under a lesser cap that it's hard for me to now imagine what this offseason would look like if we were. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I've been myself ever since last offseason that it was going to be like this. But I think when it boils down to players like Milano and Williams, is, is this deal fair? It doesn't necessarily have to be the best deal, but it can't be a bad deal. Yes. You can't, neither one, neither one of those deals is a bad deal for Milano or Williams. It's a good deal. Yeah. Right? Now, you it's a little bit like we were talking about earlier with the quality of life thing. You know, it, could I potentially get ten thousand dollars doing a different job? Yeah, but then I have to uproot my family and I have to move across the country and I kinda of like where I live and I like the taxes and I like the state. Is it worth it for ten thousand dollars? Probably not. Is it worth it for a hundred thousand dollars? Probably worth it for a hundred thousand dollars. And that's just the way people are programmed. And so for them, it's just about fair. Now, this is where your salary cap thing comes into play. The definition of fair is changing this year. Yes. Because 
you want to make sure that players and agents, they get it. Like, they understand, hey, we have a lower salary cap than we did. But after Seth Thompson signs 13 and a half, okay, and then Levante David signs 12 and a half, then all of a sudden 11 is sounding pretty fair for Matt Milano. Yep. It's not high. It's not low. It seems fair, right? Yep. But when Daryl Williams comes in at, in the nine-ish range, then you think to yourself, okay, is that – Fair. Well, Deion Dawson got 15 last year. Left tackles typically get paid more than right tackles, even though they probably shouldn't because it's just as important in the position. But that's a whole different conversation we could have on that. Oh, boy. Like, Sean McDermott was in Carolina when he was good there. And then when I broke out, I got hurt. And then I couldn't do it. And then I kind of recaptured that under Brandon Dean. Then you think to yourself, okay. Do I really want to try to recap? What if I go somewhere else and they bounce me all around the line? Like Carolina bounced me all around the line again. I had a shot at another contract. It's short enough deal that I could get another contract. But if I go to a team and they sign me to a three-year deal and then they misuse me, they kick me inside the guard, they bounce me all over the place the way that Carolina did my last year there, my value could change. With these guys, I know what I have. I know they're going to play me at right tackle, and I know I can succeed in the team. So in, in the long term, this is fair now, and it sets me up well here. So I think that those are the things that come into play for people like Darrell Williams and Matt Milano. I was like, listen, I know this team. I may not be a fit in every scheme. I'm young enough that I could get paid again. So I might as well stick in a spot where I can perform my best and still get paid fairly for it. And another thing that you know we we've talked about quite a bit here. I'm so I'm so interested to get your take on this. You know, because you said you don't really deal with hypotheticals, but we're talking about the possibility. I mean, with these signings, you're talking about the possibility of Dable and Frazier not being in Buffalo next year. I was saying the possibilities there. Like mm-hmm. you said, that you're surprised. We're surprised Brian Dable's still here. Um, mm-hmm. So you think. And Paul, I've discussed quite a bit. They're trying to get players that, yeah, they fit their system, but could also fit in another system if that happened to come into Buffalo. Do you see both Williams and Milano as guys that could thrive in a different type of a system? If they, I mean, do you think the do you think the Bills took that into consideration when they were signing them to these deals? Like, well, what if we bring a guy in that, that even though McDermott he's a four three guy, they bring a three four guy in? Could Milano as an outside? survive in that type of defense if another if a west coast guy comes in well i know the line's pretty much the same pretty much overall the line is the same could williams thrive in a you know west coast system if that happens to be implemented what is your uh, what is your do you think that played a huge factor in in the signings of both milano and williams you know it's a good thought i think that the defensive system i don't think is going to change drastically even if leslie frazier's gone because Sean McDermott is here. So I think that you you get sort of an insulation there against a significant change. I don't see, I don't see a scenario where Sean McDermott brings in a three, four defensive portion. I just don't see that being a thing. Uh, Sean McDermott is historically a four, three guy. He has always been a four, three guy. He was a four, three guy in Philadelphia. He was it again in, in Carolina. I don't think from a principal standpoint, he's likely to bring in a three, four guy, but if he brought in a 4-3 guy who was more man-focused and with more blitz-heavy from the off-ball linebackers, Milano can blitz. Milano can cover. Milano can play close to the line of scrimmage and play in downhill against the run. So his skill set is varied enough that even if they brought in a 4-3 that had different principles, right? Someone from like the Todd Bowles tree, for example, which is a 4-3, but very, very different yes. than, the, than the scheme that Leslie Frazier runs historically. Now, I know we can't say Buccaneers have kind of a weird system, but we're talking about, you know, like the New York Jets old system and things like that. I think that, you know, if you bring in like Rocky Morris, for example, you know, one's a four three, but it's it's principally it's very different. I think Milano could still succeed because he's so well rounded. It's not like Milano is just a pure cover player. Yeah. It's not like he's just a two down thumper. Milano is a well rounded player who's a converted safety and succeeds whether he's running forward or backward and fits a lot of different systems. The same thing goes with Darrell Williams. Darrell Williams, he 
the only scenario where you look at Daryl Williams and you go, uh, I don't really know, is if you always are asking your tackles to pull. And very, very, very rarely does that happen in the NFL. You have a, a heavy, heavy pulling. Because he has enough mobility to run zone. You can run zone. And I know that because they, the Bills ran a lot of zone runs. But if you're asking him to constantly be on the move and run, 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 then maybe he might be a little big for that. Yeah. But the fact of the matter is those offensive line things are so crazy rare that I, I just don't see a scenario where Daryl Williams is not, you know, he's not a player they're interested in. And you got to remember that Cody Ford is exactly what you would call a swift of foot <laughs> lineman either. And they invested a high second round ticket and trading up for him. So I don't think they have an intent of ever going to a team that would require that. And if they did, they wouldn't have gotten Cody Ford. I think I think a lot of people who do, you know, Bill's podcast and things might be uh, among, you know, the same thought process as us. Uh, they are, this coaching staff is very adamant about the players that they get and not giving up. They will literally keep making the same mistakes over and over, and this staff just won't give up. Those keep putting the players in that position again until they exceedingly fail, right? They have so much faith in their players working their way through it that sometimes it's frustrating. Ford fits that mold to me, right? Yeah. Where I just watch Cody Ford not progress, not learn the lessons as fast as I was comfortable with, right? But to get back to the to the contract talk very, very quickly, these contract extensions with Milano and Williams, I think are fascinating because, yes, they're paying players what, you know, their average – you know, salary likely is going to, you know, be set at market value, right? But likely would be fair, as, as you just mentioned. But they give the Bills so much control after the second year. Like, the Bills could walk away from any of those deals after year two, which, when we talk about the change of coordinators, makes this conversation so wild to me. Because, yes, these guys could fit in multiple schemes, but after year, once year three hits in any of those deals, the Bills could straight walk away, Right. Mm-hmm. These contracts, and you don't you don't normally see it, where there's so much team control after the first two years here. And I know that their salary cap number is low compared to the rest of the contract the first two years, but there's not a lot of signing bonus money here. There's not a lot. There's not really a lot of guarantees late in the deal. Bills could walk away from any of these, and if this is the way free agency is going to go, we're going to see so we're going to see the next four years cycle free agency aggressively like this. Because this is, if this is the way the contracts are going to are going to look, giving teams control, they're going to take that control and they're going to keep refreshing players over and over and over again, right? It, it's just so crazy to me that this might these contracts might be what we see throughout free agency, and it might not make it, its impact year one, yeah. but year two, year three, these contracts have so much team control on the back end that they, the Bills could really just walk away. Yeah, a lot of deals that we see people sign are actually one year and let's see, right. or two years and let's see. Mm-hmm. Andrew Brandt, former Packers front office gentleman who is now on Twitter and, and, and is, a, is a professor of this kind of stuff, always talks about it being one year and let's see, or two years and let's see. Mm-hmm. And most of these contracts, from a Buffalo Bills standpoint, are two years and let's see. Now, sometimes you would argue that's two years too long. Mario Addison was essentially one year in left seat. And Vernon Butler was one year in left seat. And Cole Beasley's and John Brown's were two years in left seat. And things like that. So I think that that is what gives Brandon Bean the ability to stay out of cat jail. It's the fact that you don't have scenarios where you have big signing bonuses and then you're using voidable years to do it. Right. So you don't have scenarios where you're paying for players that you cut two years ago very often. Right. And that stuff has tendency to pile and pile and pile on you, which is okay. That can pile on you. It's all right. As long as the cap keeps expanding at a rate that is equal to or greater than the amount that you keep piling on the dead cap. That's fine. But the problem is that eventually you have a scenario where that doesn't happen or something unexpected pops up. Someone gets hurt. You have a quarterback who suddenly regresses. And then you have to take a sudden smack of dead cap. For example, the Eagles and the Rams are both taking the record dead cap hit this year because, you know, they had to get rid of Carson Wentz and Jared Goff. Yeah, but now they're taking, they both set the record. 
for highest dead cap in history from a single contract. I hate to see it. And <laughs> you, just, you just hate to see it. I think the fascinating thing for me is going to be the Josh Allen contract. Yeah. The Josh Allen contract is going to be absolutely fascinating. I'm going to go through that one with five two film. Mm -hmm. It's going to be so much fun because I want to see, you know, Brandon B has only ever took a crack at a franchise quarterback one time. He drafted bring he drafted Josh Allen. Mm -hmm. And he's probably only going to take a swing at a quarterback contract a couple times. Wow. So it'll be very interesting to see, okay, let's take a look at this and say, what does he view? being reasonable for a franchise quarterback contract. His franchise quarterback contracts are not the same as these contracts we're talking about. No. Completely different set of rules. Yeah, I, and you look at, there's multiple ways to skin that cap. Look at Mahomes' deal, and then look at Dak Prescott's deal. They're nothing alike. Nope. They're not even close to being the same. Nope. At this point, if Josh Allen signed Deshaun Watson's deal, I'd be thrilled. I'd be absolutely thrilled. But, that would be like the best deal I could. I would be absolutely beside myself. Because... But, I'm scared to death of Scott Prescott's field now. <laughs> but, and Bruce, I think that's sort of the weird that's sort of the weird construct that the NFL has built for itself is that when you look at the comparable contracts, right, you look at Mahomes and you're like, okay, well, we're going to be under that, right? We, I think we all are under the understanding that Allen's deal is probably going to be under the Mahomes deal, right? Yes. They basically gave Mahomes the keys to the Chiefs kingdom, right? Yes, like, that's what, and that deal is going to be restructured 100 times over. They're going to be constantly restructuring that deal. But then you look at Wentz. You look at Goff, you look at Watson, and those are your comparable contracts here. And look at the situations that those quarterbacks have put their franchises in. Two of them are traded and one's begging to be traded. Right? It, it's, yeah. it's, it's crazy to me that you could tie your entire franchise to one player. And we've always talked that quarterbacks get, you know, elite level treatment, but they've literally kneecapped their franchises with their quarterback. And then they've ended up moving on. And it's it's madness to me that this is where we are. This can't this this has to be a trend. This can't be the way that it's always gonna be, right? Like yeah. this 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 can't be the way it's always gonna be. Well the craziest part about it is too is that you have thirty two think about it this way, you have thirty two businesses. Mm -hmm. How are they gonna run their business? The CEO that you what you wanna pay your CEO can't be based on the other business. That has completely different employees. Uh -huh. You know what I mean? That's that's why it's so fascinating to see all these contracts and all these deals. You can't compare anything to what Jerry Jones does ever. No, <laughs> no, you cannot. That's just if you want to survive in the NFL, I think you have to do something different. <laughs> Jerry Jones is is very much uh, a, in the in the mold of well, I'm just going to run this until I'm dead, and then they can't come get me then. Like, yeah. it's, it's like, come at me when I'm dead, because that's when I'm going to stop doing what I do. <laughs> the market for quarterback will keep being like this until the offensive football landscape of the NFL changes to the point where the supply and demand curve for quarterbacks is different. Once you get good enough offensive minds in there that you can plug any quarterback you need into there and have success the way that colleges have been able to do it once that happens then the market will flood with quarterbacks who can do the things you need to do which will drive the demand down until that happens quarterbacks will continue to be paid like this so you that's think, my opinion so you think you think that's based on offensive system and not necessarily the fact that the run game has basically been the the redheaded stepchild of every offense for the last seven years except if you were in Buffalo. Yeah. <laughs> Except yeah. if you're in Buffalo. Well, I think, I, and that's interesting because I think there's going to be a trend coming back where we see the running backs become more and more important because let's be real, right? As soon as offenses can get a single high safety, right, their passing numbers exponentially increase, right? The, the, the success rate, the yards, the scoring percentages, when it's a single high look, exponentially increase. So what are teams doing now? Teams are going more double high because it's easier to stop the pass with two safeties deep. It's just easier, right? But that means the run game is opening up and teams are still not totally on with how to take advantage of that. Even though running backs are at a turn and burn position, the, the fact of the matter is that these opportunities are there and so the teams don't take it. But you look at the Chiefs game against the Bills and they took advantage of the Bills saying, listen, we're gonna give you the run game. It's clear as day. They're like, listen, we're gonna give you the run game. And they, 
and I mean, they absolutely whooped our ass, but the fact is they recognized it. And I don't think a lot of teams in the NFL right now are doing that because they're so stuck into the, we're a, we're a 40 pass offense. We're, we're going to throw the ball 40 to 42 times a game. We're going to run the ball occasionally. Right. But teams are, teams are stretching to give the run yet. We don't see teams take advantage of it the way that they could. No, I agree with that. I mean, if you look at some college coordinators, I'll give you a great, great example. Steve Sarkeesian, my former Alabama coordinator, you know, Steve Sarkeesian's entire RPO offense is built around the idea that if you have two safeties high, we are going to grind you into the dust until you bring that safety down. <laughs> and, I mean, it, 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 literally, it's based on that entire concept. He openly talks about this when he's teaching the principles of his offense, is that every time we see too high look, we are going to grind them into the dust until they bring that safety down, then we're going to throw over the top. It's based on all of those concepts. Now, Alabama can do it because they have superior athletes. In the yeah. NFL, the margin for error between athletes is much, much thinner, which is why I don't think you can necessarily see those same principles applied universally in the NFL to just run, 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 run until they bring the safety down. Because the reason Alabama can do it is because they pick up seven yards to carry. Well, sure, running is very efficient when you when you have seven yards to carry. Listen, I'll live with you. I'm not a huge, you know, big running game proponent. If you can get seven yards to carry, you keep running. <laughs> that's where it becomes crazy efficient, but that doesn't happen in the NFL. So, Bruce, I got to know. Tell the people where they can find you. You can find me on Twitter and Instagram, at Bruce Exclusive. And you can find my pod, the Bruce exclusive every Thursday and Friday on the Buffalo Rumblings podcast network. Love it. And then you got, yo, hashtag nation. If you're not yet, you probably are, but if you're not following Bruce on Twitter, he is definitely a very enjoyable and informative Twitter follower. So make sure you go give him a follow. Um, Bruce, we can't thank you enough for devoting your time to hashtag today, man. We really appreciate it. Well, I appreciate you guys having me. Thanks so much. Absolutely. Take care, buddy. Catch you later. Bye. Thank you.